Okay, our final president that we're going to study is Andrew Jackson. He was the seventh president of the United States after John Quincy Adams, and he served two terms from 1829 to 1837. He was born in South Carolina on March 15, 1767. He was married to Rachel Donaldson Ro Roberts in 1791, and he was a lawyer in Tennessee. He served uh, politically and militarily. He served in the Continental Army during the American Revolution. He was very young, so um, he just... He was young, but he still served. He was a major general of the American Army during the War of 1812, and his real claim to fame militarily was um, during the battle at the Battle of New Orleans against the British. Now, peace had already been settled, but the British and the Americans still had a battle in New Orleans after the treaty was or after peace was declared, and they they really stomped the British. And so he, of course, would be the hero of that. Um, he also fought Indians out west, so he was he was used to fighting, used to battling. He was from the west, so he was seen as less cultured than those that lived in the east. The west was seen as wild and backwards, and um, he, you know, was he was rough. Uh, he was a U.S. representative and a senator from Tennessee. And he died in 1845. So keep that in mind that he's he is seen as somebody who is an outsider, who is born out in the woods somewhere. Um, during his presidency, he ran as a candidate for the newly created Democratic Political Party, and this party replaced the Democratic Republican Party, which, as you will remember, uh, was the party of Jefferson, and. Um, the Democratic political party was it continued to be this the party of the people rather than the party of the rich and the and the federalists at this point the federalists were gone all of the original questions and problems that um, the federalists and anti federalists fought over were were solved and the country was humming along uh, now Jackson started what it's not really novel, but it's it's human nature. He started what's called the spoils system. That's the practice of giving government jobs to political supporters. That only makes sense. If somebody helps you get elected, you're going to give them a job in government. Whether it's right or not is up for debate because you want the best person in the office or in a, in the position, um, not necessarily just your friend. So he fired some government workers and he replaced them with his own supporters. And people saw that as a as like one step towards the president having too much power. Um, also during his presidency, northern and southern states argued over tariffs. And tariffs are a tax on goods. So President Adams signed a new tariff and President Jackson supported it. The tariff placed high taxes on imported goods. Now, northern states wanted it because it protected their factories from imports. So people um, in the north, they said, hey, we, we are making goods such as, say, chairs, tables and chairs, but we don't want to compete with other countries' tables and chairs. And so the government would make the outside country tables and chairs cost more than American-made, northern-made especially. So um, the northern saw this tariff as good. Southern states, though, didn't want it because they didn't have many factories in the south, and they imported most of their goods from Britain and France. So uh, the north, they don't want British and French goods. In the south, they do want British and French goods. So the south ended up having to pay more for their goods. And the north said, well, fine, pay more for outside goods. We make our own up here. Um, now, it got so bad that South Carolina even threatened to leave the Union. Uh, Southerners said that Congress didn't have the right to pass tariff laws, only states could do it. And so this argument between states and federal government power started to rear its head. Um, this issue here, you see states' rights. We're going to see this again a lot, uh, especially going into the Civil War. And you even see it today where people say, you know, the federal government shouldn't be able to tell us uh, what to do in certain cer certain circumstances. Instead, the uh, states should be making these decisions. Uh, John Calhoun of the South, he supported states' rights, and he's going to end up coming up again. 
All right, so states' rights is the idea that state governments were more powerful than the federal government. And that's a problem. We, we've seen this before. This argument came up during the Articles of Confederation. And because of states' rights, our country was very weak overall. All right, uh, Daniel Webster in Massachusetts, he argued against states' rights. And he said the Constitution created a government where the federal government was, was stronger than the state governments. That's called federalism, where the powers are shared. Now, there's a difference between shared and one having more power than the other. Uh, so, you have to think about that. Uh, Congress, in the end, reduced the tariff to satisfy the South, but the southern states still weren't happy. They said, we don't want any tariff. And so, again, South Carolina threatened to secede from the Union, and secede means to withdraw. They said they're going to quit. They're going to leave the Union, start their own country. Um, so, because of that threat, Congress passed another law lowering the tariff again. And after that, South Carolina was satisfied and conflict was avoided. Now, that's what usually happens. Um, if there's something that Congress passes that's unpopular, states will threaten different things. They will secede. They'll threaten to not pay their taxes. They'll do all kinds of things to try to get Congress to do what the states want. Okay, during the second term of office, um, President Jackson became very powerful. A lot of people saw thought that he was acting like a king. Um, he would just veto anything that he didn't like. And he try, he didn't really have to work with Congress because Congress was democratic from his party. Uh, there was just not a lot of resistance to Jackson and his policies. Um, so there were many good things that Jackson did, but also some really, really awful things too. Um, his Native American policy is seen, seen as extremely damaging. Um, so it, what happened is, as you can read through here, many Americans wanted all Native American tribes to be moved west of the Mississippi River. And, uh, so Americans wanted the rich, fertile land east of the Mississippi River, but also they wanted the gold that had just been discovered in Georgia and at northern Alabama. So all these Native Americans were sitting on top of gold and good land, so President Jackson said, all right, you're all moving out. So he moved, um, he, he got some tribes to agree to move. He forced others. And so the Soak, Fox, Seminole, Wyandotte, Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Potawatomi, Chippewa, Ottawa, and Cherokee all moved west. And what we focus on here in this course is the Cherokee and the whole movement called the Trail of Tears. Because in 1838, 15,000 Cherokees were rounded up and they were forced to move west. They uh, walked over a thousand miles over a four-month period, and about 25% of them died on the trip west. And now... Um, it's it, that's sad in itself, but also the Cherokee were seen as a westernized tribe. They acted like Americans. They wore American clothing. They ate American food. They had American type government. They even appealed to the Supreme Court to, for protection from this, uh, from the Indian removal. So, in the end, it's like he was moving people out that, yes, they were Native Americans, but they were embracing American ideals even. They had schools that taught American history. I mean, it was just awful what he did to these people. Um, and so here's a picture of the where the tribes came from and where they were pushed to. They were pushed out west here to Oklahoma. And if you've ever been to Oklahoma, you know that it's very, many parts of it are just a wasteland. It's desert. It's awfully cold and horrible weather and poor soil. So these people that were used to hunting and farming even, they just didn't do well. And still today, Native Americans are in such poverty for a variety of reasons. And one of them, well, those reasons is that they're on land that's no good. So it's really heartbreaking. Um, yeah, the Soot Cherokee were referred to as the civilized tribe because they tried to fit in with the white culture. They adopted many customs of the white culture, like farming, schools, European-style housing, uh, European-style clothing. Um, and you can see here, this just looks like a regular town. And this guy looks like a regular dude, a regular American, but he's a Native American. He's a Cherokee. 
So it's really sad that these people were, what what happened to these people. There's a picture of the uh, Native Americans being rounded up and being sent on their trip from Georgia to out west of Oklahoma Territory on the Trail of Tears. Um... Yeah, the, so the reservation system was created, um, and General Winfield Scott really pushed, forced these these uh, Native American tribes west. So, the end of our unit here, we have Andrew Jackson as president. By his second term, though sectional differences were becoming very clear within the, the United States, the issue of tariffs, slavery, Native Americans, and government powers all were like seen in the shadow of sectionalism. This anger, mistrust, tension between the North, South, and West. And so after uh, Andrew Jackson, we have another nine presidents that are going to have something, you know, gonna that are going to push us towards this oncoming uh, civil war in 1861. So good luck. Take your test. Get over a 70. Have a good weekend and we will see you next week, hopefully in the constructivist classroom. And if you don't choose to do the constructivist classroom, you'll be in the, um, the standard class and that'll be okay too. So good luck.